Wendy Mitchell was a fit and healthy 56-year-old NHS manager when she began showing the first symptoms of dementia. A divorcee with two grown-up daughters, she was eventually diagnosed with early onset, Alzheimer's. Today she is 61 and still managing to live independently at her home in Yorkshire. In a powerful and deeply affecting memoir, she gives the first ever account of what it's like to suffer this devastating disease by someone who is actually going through it. Plus item guide D equals IEB 4E25939 EA ka 816 SRC equals HTTP colon slash slash I dot daily mail dot co dot UK slash I slash pics slash 2018 slash 01 slash 12 slash 23 slash 48129 D7 FO 0005780 and underscore A underscore powerful underscore and underscore deeply underscore affecting underscore memoir underscore former. NHS underscore manager A19 underscore 15157996105161.jpg height equals 1016 width equals 634 alt equals in a powerful and deeply affecting memoir, former NHS, manager Wendy Mitchell, 61, gives the first ever account of what it's like to suffer from dementia class equals blocks bordering share, greater than September 2012 advertising in read invented by TZM running along a path by the river with an impending sense of something I can put my finger on. It's lingered for a few weeks now. More honestly, a few months. How can I possibly describe it? Perhaps, that's why I haven't been to the doctors, why I haven't mentioned it to anyone else, not even my two grown-up daughters. My head just feels fuzzy. Life is a little, less sharp. It was this fuzziness that had pulled me from the sofa this afternoon. I wasn't sure where I'd get the energy to run, but I knew I'd find it. I'd push, through that initial wall, just as I had dozens of times before, and when I got home I'd feel invigorated. That's what a run had always done. I tackled the three peaks challenge last year and I can still conjure up the feeling I had when I reached the top of Panagant, the first peak, it felt like I'd conquered the world, aside from my rubber soles hitting the path, the only other sound is a swish of oars breaking the stillness of the river. But then, in a second, everything changes. Without, warning, I'm falling. There's no time to put my hands out as the concrete comes crashing towards me. My face hits the ground. I feel a crack. Something hot and sticky bursts, from within. I reach up to my face and my hand returns to me covered in blood. After being patched up in A&E, I go back to the path, searching for the wonky paving slab that's left me with two black eyes, yet, thankfully, no broken bones. The place where I fell is easily recognizable from the spatter of red where my face hit the pavement. I search all around, but there's no dip, no loose slab, nothing to trip over. So what was it, then? I go home, battered and bruised, and, let lethargy cover me like a blanket. Plus item guide D equals I3C 8295E674A74 at 2 SRC equals HTTP colon slash slash I dot daily mail dot co dot UK slash I slash pics slash 2018 slash 01 slash 12 slash 23 slash 481435A7000578 image A22 underscore 15158005023.jpg height equals 422 width equals 634 alt equals Wendy. Pictured with her daughters Gemma and Sarah, was a fit and healthy 56-year-old when she began, showing the first symptoms of the disease class equals blocks bordering share, greater than a few days later, my tiredness drags me to my GP. I just, I just feel slower than usual, I say, and he studies me for a second or two. You were fit, you exercise, you eat well, you don't smoke and at 56, you're relatively young, he says. But there comes a time, when we all have to admit to ourselves that we're just slowing down. He sits back in his chair and folds his arms. You work hard, Wendy. Maybe take some time off. I'm, actually in the middle of annual leave from my job as an NHS manager at St. James's Hospital in Leeds, and the idea of taking any more time off is, preposterous to someone like me. At work, I manage rosters for hundreds of nurses, keeping all that information stored in my head. My colleagues nickname me the guru because my recall is, so sharp, because I can problem solve in a second, remembering who works night shifts, who needs which day off. They can't possibly manage without me. I've always been super organized. As a single, mom, I had to be. I am the one who drives all over the country, who walks for miles on holiday, never frightened of getting lost. I'd brought up my daughters, Gemma, and Sarah, alone, ever since their dad left when they were four and seven. It was hard. But there was always a way. That was my motto. I was the one who, never forgot anything. But this. This tiredness, just isn't me. 
plus atom guide d equals if 66 b 71 a 41 c b 24 c 3 s r c equals http colon slash slash i dot daily mail dot co dot uk slash i slash pics slash 2018 slash 01 slash 12 slash 23 slash 48 12 bd 5 3 0 0 0 0 0 5 7 8 0 image a 20 underscore 1 5 1 5 7 9 9 7 0 7 4 7 7 dot jpg height equals 439 width equals 634 alt equals a divorcee with two grown-up daughters, she was eventually diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. She had become reliant on post-it notes to remember what she had to do during the day class equals blocks bordering share, greater than age, shrugs my GP. Months go by and the snowdrift that seems to have settled in my mind remains, along with the lack of energy and the same feeling I can't put my finger on. And then it happens again. I'm out running and I fall flat on the pavement, this time bruising nothing more than my ego. There are another three falls in quick succession. My brain and my legs just aren't talking to each other. Everything's getting slower. On bad days, my mind can't instantly recall names and faces and places like it used to. This really just isn't me, I am sitting in a hospital waiting room. With an overnight bag at my side purely as a precaution. The sensation of a head half filled with cotton wool has continued for months, and this weekend it had been much worse. When I got to work on Monday, a colleague noticed how my words were slurred, and now I'm here. My daughter Sarah, who's training to be a nurse, comes with me, to the hospital. They tell me that they are keeping me in for monitoring. There's an electronic roster on a screen that I can just make out from my bed. The nurses have no idea that I can read from it just how understaffed they are. I hate hospitals, and I know I make a terrible patient. But I don't panic. I have a low, resting heart rate. I'm fit and healthy, aren't I? The next few days are taken up with tests and scans. The word stroke is mentioned, but nothing is confirmed. Plus Aiden, I dot D dot equals I 296563D0 F684422 ASRC equals HTTP colon slash slash I dot daily mail dot co dot UK slash I slash pics slash 2018 slash 01 slash 13 slash 00 slash 48 12 BD5 B0005785264725 M40 underscore 15158029901013 dot JPG height equals 778 width equals 634 alt equals today Wendy is managing to live independently at her own home in Yorkshire class equals blocks bordering share greater than I want to leave I want to go home and put on my work clothes and return to my office not be stuck here at the mercy of consultants too busy to give me more than five minutes of their time I close my eyes and long for visiting time when normal conversations can resume when I can hear what's going on in the outside world where routine means independence and a life fully lived it turns out there's a hole in my heart they think that may have been the cause of the stroke but they're not sure. They make me an appointment with, a neurologist and finally discharge me, recovering at home, the next two months drag. Each day I wonder how much more daytime TV I can take before I risk exposing myself to, another stroke. I miss the team camaraderie that used to fill my day. I miss the buzz and the working to deadlines. Plus item guide dot d dot equals i to 75 f 40 d 79 f 29 src equals http colon slash slash i dot daily mail dot co dot uk slash i slash pix slash 2018 slash 01 slash 12 slash 23 slash 48129 d 5 image a 24 underscore 15158011892511 dot jpg height equals 951 width equals 634 alt equals I glance around the table at the familiar faces, and yet I can't recall their names. She writes class equals blocks bordering share, greater than I used to wonder what it would be like to be retired, to do all those things I never had time for, and yet now I lack both the energy and the inclination. But I notice something else, too. As the date of returning to work comes closer, I start to doubt myself in a way I never have before. What if I don't know what I'm doing anymore? What if I can't remember the system? March 2013 three months after the stroke I'm back at work. The days go by as they always did, and even though maybe I creak rather than leap into action, my confidence grows. The things I do forget, names or numbers, places, people, well, that's understandable. It's because I've been off for months. At least that's what everyone says, and I start to believe it. Almost. Two months later, I'm sitting in front of a consultant neurologist, trying to pinpoint the vagueness I've been feeling for months. 
what sense would it make to her if I told her that the pile of yellow post-it notes scattered on the carpet by my bed had got thicker and thicker, as I woke numerous times in the night desperate to remember all I'll need to get through a day in the office. My mind just doesn't feel sharp, is all I can offer, and the consultant nods and writes down some notes. A month on, I'm seeing a clinical psychologist called Joe. She hands me three words that I'll need to remember and repeat to her at the end of our session. Sounds simple enough. I do some memory tests. At the end of the session, Joe closes her notebook and folds her arms across her chest. Now, can you tell me those three words that I asked you to remember? She asks. But I can't. Is there anything I should do to help myself in the times when my mind feels particularly foggy? I ask. There may be times when you become disorientated, the fog will descend and your surroundings will be unfamiliar, she says. But the most important thing to remember is not to panic. Give the fog time to pass, let the world become clear again. And it will. That's all. Joe says she'll see me again in 12 months, I am, sitting opposite my daughter Sarah while she reads a letter from Joe after our last meeting. I can tell just from watching her how far through the letter she is. She's currently, reading the bit where Joe has detailed how independent I am, how well I manage at home, how organized I am. But then she turns the page and I see her, brow furrow and I remember the moment when my own did the same. It's one line below a heading that says opinion in thick, bold type. Sarah looks up and I catch, her eye. Dementia? She says. But that isn't what it says. I know exactly what it says, it is possible that this is a profile of the early stages of a dementic process. I've burned the words into my memory. Sarah puts the letter down. Plus item guide D equals I 263221468721775SRC equals HTTP colon slash slash I dot daily mail dot co dot UK slash I slash pix slash 2018 slash 01 slash 12 slash 23 slash 48129D5 B O O O O O five seven eight five two six four seven two five image A twenty six underscore one five one five eight oh one four seven five three eight four dot JPG height equals four hundred twenty three width equals six hundred 134 alt equals where once there was pale green carpet, I'm now crunching yellow post-it notes, between my toes class equals block sporter and share, greater than but it can't be that, she says. You were so fit and healthy? It doesn't seem fair. Exactly, I say. I'm sure it's nothing like that, but, I suppose they have to cover every eventuality. A few weeks later there is another letter, this time from the neurologist. Both of my girls are here to read it. To be certain of this representing an early dementia, we would need to demonstrate deteriorating cognition in 6 to 12 months time, writes the neurologist. If no change, I would diagnose mild cognitive impairment. However, if there is a definite deterioration then the diagnosis would be dementia. The three of us sit quietly, and I look across the living room at my two daughters, now grown women, though often still little girls in my eyes. That's nothing to do with my memory or whatever it is that's afflicting my brain. That's the lens a mother always views her children through. No matter how old they get, or how tall they grow over us, the urge to protect them never dims. Six months later, I'm in a meeting at work. Faces look at me expectantly as I prepare to explain the benefits of a new rostering system, despite the fact I haven't fully comprehended them myself. I glance around the table, at the familiar faces, and yet I can't recall their names. Seeds of worry whittle away inside as I shuffle my papers, confused about where to start. I look up. We expect to start rolling out the system in two months' time. I pause, every eye upon me, but the word I need next is lost. There's a blank in my mind where it should be. Silence hangs in the room, and for a fraction of a second I'm sure they're wondering if I'm fit for this job. I feel stupid then. Stupid, frustrated, confused, humiliated. An hour later, the meeting ends, people file from the room and then it comes to me. The word I was trying to remember was an apostrophe dot 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 dot
The nurse tells me that I can sleep as, I lie here, but I'm determined to stay awake and alert, as if somehow my brain can trick the system. Deep inside I know that I will find the roadblock, in my brain. A few days later, I'm driving in my silver Suzuki and coming up to a junction. The car behind beeps and flashes me. I glance down at the dashboard, and understand why, the speedometer is wavering somewhere around 10 miles per hour how did that happen? Still the junction is approaching too quickly. I can't think in time. Another beep. I cringe. I, turn left instead of right, away from my destination. The car behind me is gone. But my skin is tingling, panicked. My breath is short. I'm lost inside. I couldn't process it, quick enough. My brain and my body weren't talking, I think. I pull over and lean over the steering wheel. I close my eyes, take deep breaths. Why couldn't I turn right? The traffic zooms by, everyone else rushing here and there on automatic. Nothing has changed for them. But the metaphorical roadblock I'd been imagining just days before is real now. You've been driving, all your life, Wendy, I tell myself. But now I don't feel safe. I check my mirror, look over my shoulder, everything exaggerated, more like a learner than someone who's been driving for 33 years. Slowly, I pull out onto the road, holding tight onto every nerve until I see my street approaching. Somehow I get back home. I put my keys down, in their usual place, in a dish on the hall table. And there they sit, useless, non-functional, idle. The piece of paper Sarah has put on the table in, front of us looks like it has a giant spider drawn on it. A giant spider with mum in the middle. It's a brainstorming diagram, with words in fat bubbles at the, end of each spindly leg, living slash housing, anxiety, interests. I think these are some of the things that we may need to think about if the diagnosis does turn out to, be dementia, she says. Plus item guide dot d dot equals i61 ff174405 a6534 fsrc equals http colon slash slash i dot daily mail dot co dot uk slash i slash pix slash 2018 slash 01 slash 13 slash 00 slash 48129 d5 f0005785264725 image a28 underscore 15158018718 jpg height equals 402 width equals 634 alt equals I've still managed to arrive at my desk an hour earlier than everyone else. I used to use the time in a deserted office to get ahead for the day, but now I pull the pile of sticky notes from my handbag and work through them one by one. Class equals blocks border and share, greater than as her finger darts across the diagram, something tightens deep inside me. I tell Sarah I'm not ready for this yet. A flicker of hurt crosses her face, something only I would notice. We don't even know if there will be a dementia diagnosis, I say. Some of the things you've written our way in the future. But. It's too soon. I don't mean. To snap. I wake and sit on the edge of my bed, looking down at my feet. Where once there was pale green carpet, I'm now crunching yellow post-it notes between my. Toes. The pile has grown thicker after another restless night of waking, turning. Remembering something else I'll need for the next day. I glance at my alarm clock. 4.50 AM. The same time. I've been waking for work for years ready and out the door for the first bus at 5.35 a.m. I bend over and unpeel a few post-its from under my heels, by the time I look up again, it is 5 a.m., 10 minutes lost. How did that happen? I need to move, but I can't think what I do first. Dress? Eat? Shower? At work I turn on my computer and the login screen flashes up. I stare at it for a second longer than I know I should, wondering what it's asking from me. I've still managed to arrive at my desk an hour earlier than everyone else. I used to use the time in a deserted office to get ahead for the day, but now